very much, Ludger, for this very kind introduction. Um, it's very nice to be here with everyone. Um, it's a very interesting uh, initiative uh, to have these uh, unique universities who all are located in cities undergoing uh, structural transformation um, from, I guess, uh, former industrial cities to something resembling post-industrial cities. So I think it's appropriate talking about deindustrialization and the memory of an industrial past. Uh, what I intend to do today is to talk a little bit about deindustrialization and its consequences, because deindustrialization is in many parts of the world the prerequisite to memorializing an industrial past. And the way that an industrial past is memorialized is often through industrial heritage. So I'll talk a little bit about heritageization um, and the way in which it reflects particular ways of memorializing an industrial past. And I've then divided the world into different parts, which I would argue share particular ways of memorializing an industrial past. First of all, what I call the Anglo world, um, where we have places like the US, Canada, North America, but also Britain in Europe and Australia. Secondly, continental European countries, West European countries, like Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. Then post-communist Eastern Europe after 1990. Then post-communist China. And finally, the global South. And then I'll try and draw some tentative conclusions. Now, if we look at deindustrialization, then I think it is a good starting point to say that deindustrialization is now a global phenomenon. Although, um, when we look at the latest cycle of deindustrialization from the 1960s onwards, deindustrialization itself is something that goes back further than this. Uh, we have, for example, books looking at deindustrialization in the Languedoc in France, which uh, covers the period from the 1870s to the 1910s. So we can see that there are earlier forms of deindustrialization. But if we look at the latest phase of deindustrialization from the 1960s onwards, then it starts in the global north. And there is also a direct relationship between deindustrialization in the global north and industrialization in the global south, because several of the key industries in the global north move to the south, especially, of course, the textile industry, but also the steel industry, um, some of the extractive industries uh, like coal, where, where it has been much cheaper to extract them in the global south or places like Australia, if you compare it to the costs that uh, this had in Europe, for example. So deindustrialization um, meant that areas that used to be highly industrial had to change. And in Germany, we have a, a special word for this, which is actually quite difficult to translate. Um, in German, it's called Strukturwandel, and it literally translates as structural change. But um, most people in the English language um, will look at you rather blankly uh, when you talk uh, to them about structural change, because in the Anglo world, it is much more usual to talk about deindustrialization. But in Germany, in fact, many people do not like to talk about deindustrialization and prefer to talk about structural change, because it already indicates that there are certain um, normative assumptions and values that are uh, um, carried by particular ways of phrasing things in different vernacular languages. So the term structural change, Strukturwandel, in German carries quite a positive connotation. There is the idea that you can actually do something to facilitate structural change, to help regions that used to be industrial to be something else. 
that there is an active element in there. And the term deindustrialization as such is much more passive, is much more something that is happening to regions, um, that it is almost a kind of like a natural disaster that cannot be changed. Um, so it is lacking this kind of active element of Strukturwandel um, in the German language. And I think this is already reflecting particular ways of dealing with deindustrialization, which were quite distinct in the Anglo countries in comparison to Germany and in comparison uh, to other West European countries. So if we look at deindustrialization, um, and I, I said at the beginning, deindustrialization is a global phenomenon. We now also have many places in the global south which are already deindustrializing because the industries that were once there have moved on. This is particularly visible with the textile industry. If we look at places like Mumbai or Ahmedabad uh, on the Indian subcontinent, um, there we had a booming textile industry in the 90s and 2000s, but since then it has moved on to places like Bangladesh or to Vietnam. So we have the phenomenon of deindustrialization also in parts of the global south. Deindustrialization is first and foremost an economic process. It has to do with uh, economic processes of production, of costs for production, of global trade routes, uh, of globalization of economic processes. So uh, we need to understand deindustrialization economically, but I think we also need to understand it as a political, a social, and a cultural process, in particular if we are going into the regions that are suffering from deindustrialization, and if we want to understand what is happening in those regions as a response to deindustrialization. We have um, often in those regions an attempt to manage deindustrialization from above. So uh, sort of politics uh, that is seeing that deindustrialization is happening, is developing strategies of how to deal with deindustrialization. But we also have at the same time a response to deindustrialization from below, in particular through various urban social movements traditional ones such as trade unions, uh, also political parties, but new urban social movements that often gel around particular issues. For example, what is going to happen to a particular neighborhood if the steelworks that was next door is closing, if the people who live in that neighborhood and who used to work in that steelworks are finding themselves unemployed, if there are pressures in terms of rent market, uh, if there are processes of gentrification, of people having to move out of their particular neighborhoods because they can't afford the rent anymore. Um, so then we have the development of particular forms of urban movement who are also a response to deindustrialization and to seek in their own ways to shape processes of deindustrialization. Uh, so I think uh, in my own perspective, in order to understand deindustrialization, it's important to relate deindustrialization studies to uh, social movement studies, but also to memory studies and to heritage studies, because I think the memory both of deindustrialization and of the industrial past that is more and more moving into the distance is important in understanding how those regions cope with deindustrialization. Now, if we look at the development of industrial heritage and its relationship to path of deindustrialization, then um, we can see that we have two particular ways. We have one way where we have, as a result of deindustrialization, the construction of industrial heritage. And sometimes, like in the region where uh, I'm sitting today in the Ruhr region, um, the development of massive landscapes of industrial heritage. Um, here in this area, you can't walk 100 meters without falling over some kind of rusty part of the former uh, industry. Um, or the other strategy is a refusal to construct industrial heritage as a form of memory politics. You simply eradicate everything, the firm goes bust, the mine closes, the steelworks closes, you get rid of the mine or the steelwork, 
uh, and you build something else uh, in its place. And as we shall see, this is also a strategy that was employed in some of the countries we will be looking at. So the forms of industrial heritage that emerge are usually related to memorializing uh, these two aspects, deindustrialization and the industrial past itself. And there are three different memory regimes, I would argue, that are associated with memorializations of an industrial past, which um, I call antagonistic, cosmopolitan, and agonistic. And this all draws very much from an article that was published by my colleagues Hans Lauge Hansen and Anna Centobull in the journal Memory Studies in 2016 that was titled On Agonistic Memory, where they develop uh, these uh, types of memory regimes. And I think it is important to see what kind of memory regime fits which pathway of deindustrialization. An antagonistic memory describes a form of memory that works very much in relation to a binary divide between a them and an us, a positively connotated us, a negatively connotated them. Um, the them being very much an enemy. Um, so sort of traditional nationalism, for example, and nationalist memory very much works on antagonistic lines. Cosmopolitan memory is a memory which starts from the assumption that uh, there are particular universal values and norms that uh, fit everyone uh, in human society. Um, there is also in cosmopolitan memory because of its strong commitment to ideas about uh, universal human rights, uh, a them and an us. Um, the um, us usually being uh, liberal democracies which respect human rights and the them being uh, dictatorships, totalitarianism, fascism, communism, regimes that do not accept uh, the validity of those cosmopolitan values that are at the core of cosmopolitan memory. An agonistic memory is a form of memory that um, is in some ways close to antagonistic memory, but unlike antagonistic memory, it tries to avoid a thinking in a clear binary divide between them and us. Instead, it accepts the possibility that there are, in every political process, um, different positions. And these different positions are all seeking to create a majority behind them. So. The, the, the political process um, in agonistic memory means, or in agonistic politics means that there are different positions, uh, that there are adversaries and that the political process needs those adversarial times of, uh, of politics or if we relate it to memory of memory regimes. We can perhaps go into the uh, nitty gritty of this uh, rather complex differentiation between different forms of um, memory regimes um, in the discussion. But I think if we are uh, interested in the forms of memorialization that are created within the industrialization processes, then we need to ask ourselves the question, which actors in the industrialization processes tell which narratives in order to promote which memory politics. Um, this is a question that is very close to the program of critical heritage studies as it was developed by Laura Jane Smith and others within the Critical Heritage Studies Association. Um, and they constantly refer to the power imbalances that are always present in the making of heritage and these power imbalances are also always present in the making of memory landscapes about deindustrialization and industrial pasts. Now, if we, if we look very briefly at the typology I'm proposing, and if we start with the Anglo world, then of course, it is always important to say First of all, that within these typological categories that I'm suggesting here, there are, of course, huge differences. So I'm not trying to say 
that either deindustrialization or the memorial regimes connected to deindustrializations are the same in all of the Anglo world. There are huge differences between even the four countries that I just list here. But I think they also have things in common. Um, what they have in common, for example, is that deindustrialization takes place under conditions of market radicalism and neoliberalism, in particular in the US and Britain, of course, with the uh, advent of the governments of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher around 1980 in both countries, we have very programmatic attempts to put into practice uh, neoliberal politics that was based on forms of market radicalism that basically said that it's best to leave everything to the market. Uh, the self-regulation of the market will see things through. And uh, this meant in times of deindustrialization that you did nothing um, as a government and that produced in the United States, for example, the famous Rust Belt. Uh, where scholars have been talking about uh, ruin porn and landscapes of desolation that were left by deindustrialization um, in places such as Pittsburgh, the former um, steelworking town in uh, northeastern Ohio, or also Detroit, the car making uh, town in Michigan. Canada is a little bit different uh, from the United States uh, because what we see happen in Canada is that um, a specific form of Canadian nationalism uh, is merged uh, in the debates on deindustrialization and ultimately makes for a far more interventionist, especially regional government, um, provincial government uh, in Canada. Um, we, that is something that we do not see in the United States. We move to Britain. We again have a purer form, if you like, of neoliberalism uh, with um, a similar kind of um, terrible consequences for the former industrial areas, especially in the north of England, in South Wales, in Scotland, uh, where we also uh, see landscapes of desolation and especially in the minor strike the picture here is from Orgreaves near Sheffield uh, a major demonstration of miners that was um, that was broken up by by the police with an enormous use of violence and I think many scholars who have dealt with the minor strike in 1984-85 uh, have argued that what we see in Britain in the mid-1980s uh, can be described in terms of a class war from above where uh, the state is deliberately trying to break what arguably was the most powerful union in the world until the early 1980s, the National Union of Mine Workers uh, in Britain. Australia is also in many respects a very different case from the other three because it's to such a huge extent dependent on extractive industries, which is not the case um, in any of the other three countries. Um, we also, of course, uh, have um, uh, two booming metropoles in Sydney and Melbourne, which used to be industrial cities, um, which form their own kind of particular problems for, for industrial heritage. But what we find, I would argue, in many of the Anglo countries, and what we find in particular in the US and in Britain, is a very strong uh, industrial heritage from below movement, which develops, I would argue, strong antagonistic forms of memory struggle. And this is in the face of an official memorialization, which is practically non-existent. So if we take the example of Britain, we see that in places that were previously industrialized, uh, such as uh, the South Wales coal industry, uh, the mines are closed um, after 1985, after the end of the miners' strike, very quickly all of the mines get closed uh, and all of the mines are taken down practically um, and are replaced with something else, community centers, uh, technology parks, uh, housing estates, um, sports um, facilities, uh, so that there is a deliberate attempt from the government to eradicate any trace of an industrial past. Uh, opposition to that comes very much from below, from social movements from below. So the few cases of industrial heritage that we have in South Wales are created by those oppositional uh, movements. 
um, often uh, alliances of trade unionists, local labor-run councils, um, uh, intellectuals um, coming from the universities, um, preservationists, and both the Rhondda Heritage Park in the Rhondda Valley and Blynevin, the UNESCO World Heritage Site in South Wales, uh, are created in this kind of oppositional from below way of uh, creating an industrial past. And the content of that industrial past then is very antagonistic because it, it is very much on the side of the former miners and against this kind of neoliberal market radicalism. Um, so we have a very antagonistic setup of the memorial landscape in those countries. It's a very different story, I would argue, in continental Europe, where we have much stronger corporatist uh, traditions, both liberal and illiberal, um, uh, but overall traditions in which deindustrialization is managed to a far greater degree than in the Anglo countries. The role of employers, associations and unions is much greater, and in association often with the state, we find attempts to manage deindustrialization. So very different from the market radicalization in the Anglo world. And one of the best examples of this, I would say, is what in the English literature is often referred to as Rhenish capitalism in Germany. Um, and this kind of Rhenish capitalism, this corporatist system of employers, unions, and the state trying to bring about Strukturwandel, to bring about structural change, uh, means that um, there is a much more positive idea of effecting change and also effecting a future for those regions undergoing structural economic change. And that also means that uh, here the landscape of industrial heritage is often produced uh, in conjunction from below and from above. And I think this is also the reason why we find in the Ruhr this enormous landscape of industrial heritage, which is really looking uh, for um, a parallel anywhere else in the world, as far as I can see. Um, and because you, you can use that landscape of industrial heritage to uh, remind people about the proud industrial past and the relative successful way of transitioning from that industrial past to a post-industrial future. Obviously, other countries in Western Europe are different. Uh, so we have a much stronger statist um, tradition in France and consequently also more heritageization from above, I would say, uh, in France. We have in Italy uh, much more localist approaches, uh, very much geared on particular industrial cities, although you also have huge industrial regions like the famous industrial triangle in the north of Italy between Genoa, Milano and Turin, um, the, you, you, you find that this is a region only in imagination because ultimately all of the cities in this region have found their own uh, strategy of how to cope with the industrialization and the memory of an industrial past. Um, in Spain, we also have um, uh, strong industrial regions such as Asturias, which have been deindustrializing. Asturias, like the Ruhr in Germany, also dependent heavily on coal and steel. Um, and here we also find a very state managed approach to deindustrialization. Um, it's an interesting case because, um, unlike many of the other a former industrial region, it has not developed a right-wing populist uh, politics, but instead it has developed a left-wing populist politics. Uh, why this may be the case, we can perhaps also go into that in, in the discussion, because I don't think I will have time uh, to do this uh, here. I'm, I'm aware that I'm already uh, running uh, out of um, time here. So let's briefly look at post-communist Eastern Europe, where we have the demise of communism around 1990. And after 1990, then very rapid deindustrialization, also often under the influence of market radicalism. Many of the post-communist regimes in East Central and Eastern Europe adopt market radicalism as an antidote to 
to communism. And we see that in particular, steel industries, coal industries, heavy industry uh, is in the 1990s very quickly deteriorating because it cannot compete on uh, the world markets. But the people suffering from deindustrialization have the dilemma that they have no one who wants to fight for them, because especially if you think of miners and steel workers, they were the archetypal heroes of the old communist regimes. They were the proletarians for which these communist regimes supposedly were speaking for. And even if those workers did not never belonged to uh, the most uh, enthusiastic supporters of communism, still after 1919, 1990, um, they found that um, they had very few political forces that were willing to stand up for them. There are some exceptions, notably Poland, um, and I think this is for an obvious reason, because workers' dissidents in Poland through Solidarność, the trade union that was formed in Poland um, uh, in the early 1980s, um, meant that uh, workers had a much higher um, prestige after the demise of communism. And therefore, we also find in Poland considerable attention to the industrial, former industrial landscapes in places such as Upper Silesia, for example. The dominant memory regime uh, in post-communist Eastern Europe is also very much an antagonistic memory, which is closely related to an antagonistic memory uh, in the debates around the communist past uh, that we find across all East Central and Eastern European countries. An interesting case is that of China, where we of course still have a communist government, a communist party ruling um, the country, um, but where we have seen massive change, especially after Deng Xiaoping's uh, rule. Uh, so in the late 1970s, we see massive industrialization. After 1978, we see a turn to um, marketization, the opening up of markets, opening up China to world markets, but also uh, creating internal markets. Um, and in fact, what we have been observing over the last couple of years or decades now almost is the development of a turbo capitalist system uh, that is governed and overseen by uh, a ruling communist party. But within that system, we have seen pockets of deindustrialization, in particular in the established state sector, i.e. the non-privatized sector of the economy, and especially in areas that were early industrialized in China, such as the northeast of the country around Changchun, uh, where much of the steel industry, but also the car industry um, is and was, one has to say, located. Um, here, the problem is that the memory of the industrial past is strongly contaminated by memories of colonialism, because this northeastern part of China um, is also known under the name of Manchuria. Uh, the Chinese don't like to use this name today because it is connected to Japanese colonialism and imperialism in the 1930s. But it's not just Japanese colonialism, but also Russian colonialism that is very much the issue uh, in the northeast of uh, the country. So, um, Apart from this problem about the contamination, I think um, we do find um, massive attempts to create landscapes of industrial heritage from above through the Communist Party in brand new state-of-the-art museums like the ones that, I've show, that I show you here in Shenyang um, in China, um, industrial um, history museums uh, which are uh, created to demonstrate um, in especially the role of the Communist Party in leading China to uh, various successes in the past and in the present. So it's a very teleologically oriented history geared towards the achievements of the Communist Party. We will find very little in those memorializations of the past, either about ordinary workers um, or about uh, victims of deindustrialization. Uh, so we have a strong heritageization from above um, with an almost complete absence of the everyday, raising the question for whom this heritage is actually constructed. 
The global south is also, as I said at the beginning, facing deindustrialization um, in places such as M Mumbai, Ahmedabad, which I've mentioned, but also Johannesburg and South Africa, uh, where we have, again, sort of uh, coal uh, in particular, but um, in parts uh, also uh, other industries that have been declining, Sao Paulo and Brazil, Buenos Aires and Argentina, and the, Zamb the Zambian Copper Belt, they're all cases where we see pockets of deindustrialization. Uh, the problem that we often find in the global south can be described with a famous phrase by the post-colonial scholar Deepesh Chakrabarti, who in his book, Provincializing Europe talked about the waiting room of history in which post-colonial countries find themselves in, i.e. they are never the first, they are always behind the colonialist metropoles uh, in the global north, and that's the same with industrial heritage, whereas, for example, we can claim in England that it was the first industrial nation and therefore much of the industrial heritage is valuable because it has been the first. This is rarely the case in the global south. It is often a copy from the global north, and it is also often a copy directly related to processes of imperialism and colonialism in the 19th and 20th centuries. Nevertheless, we do find uh, many global interchanges, especially in the area of memorialization of the industrial past through organizations such as TIKI, uh, the International Commission for the Preservation of Industrial Heritage, and the Association of Critical Heritage Studies. But when we look at the literature on deindustrialization and heritageization, we find an almost complete dominance of the uh, global north in that literature so that we can say that we are at a point where we really have to think about how do we bring the global south into the discussion that is largely being taking place in the global north. Now, very briefly, by way of conclusion, I think when we look at memorializations of an industrial past, we are often facing uh, constructions of a practical past through industrial heritage. And the practical past here refers to the last book of uh, Hayden White, uh, where he has been arguing that um, our approach to history um, has to be determined by what he calls a practical past, i.e. what stories do we want to tell to ourselves and to others in the present about the past with a view to which future. Um, and if we examine the landscapes of memorialization of an industrial past, we find that many of them are geared towards such uh, a practical past, um, both in the memory politics from above and in the memory politics from below. And therefore it is worth examining the exact way in which these memory politics from above and below relate to each other, and also to examine in greater depth how pathways of deindustrialization are leading into narratives of heritageization and contributing in various ways to forms of a politicized memory and memory struggles around both the memory of the industrial past and the memory of deindustrialization. Um, in many parts of the world, the memorialization from below is very much trying to delegitimize market radicalism. Uh, but in, with every form of memorialization, I think we have to ask ourselves, um, how is it um, related to um, present day positions in view of the creation of futures for those places that were once determined by an industrial past? So uh, is the industrial heritage that we are finding in different parts of the world today, is it enabling the agency of people and of social movements from below in forging that particular future, or uh, is it uh, serving some other means? I think um, understanding the industrialization and the memorialization of an industrial past uh, means to uh, understand those memorialization processes as part and parcel of an ongoing political struggle. And that's where I leave it, I think. Thank you very much for listening.